time at the end I could do that. Uh, so, the, the, if, if the um, Empire State Building is lighting itself with LEDs, what about us? Uh, what are we doing? And so you might be interested to know that Hartford, which is a town near here in Vermont, is the first all LED town in Vermont. And I'm not going to read the ordinance, but the ordinance basically says that it's going to be LED street lighting. Now what are LEDs? Actually, I thought I might use an LED pointer. We'll see how this works. Everybody's familiar with a laser pointer. Let's try an LED pointer. Uh, you also may not know that I spent my PhD working on the second commercially sold laser. And I'm very interested in lasers. And so it makes me very sad that I can do pointing with an LED rather than a laser. <laughs> But there's also a message to be learned by this pointer, which is that it's not making a point. It makes quite a, a square, as you see. That square is the image of the actual LED itself. And if you try to look at it, you'll find it's very bright. Uh, so you can't see it that way, but that's uh, uh, what LEDs do. So anyway, they, they're requiring all street lighting to be LEDs. And the nice thing about it is an LED works with very low power levels, which I'll show you in a bit, and therefore you can have solar power, and you don't even need to have your LED lighting on the grid, which certainly helps in rural areas like this. What's Hanover doing? All I did is put Hanover and LEDs into the web, and I found out that four buildings here are being turned into LED lighting as a way to save energy. I won't go through the numbers, I just wanted to show you. These were plans in 2011. I don't know if they've done it yet or not. So, what's coming, whether we like it or not, is LEDs for general illumination. And the big challenge is to be able to replace a 60 watt light bulb with an LED. And by the time you get done with this lecture, you'll see what the challenge is in that. And there are several ways that you could make it, and I'll, you'll understand this by the end of the lecture. Uh, right now, they're being used pretty efficiently for display lights and for, for general illumination when you want sort of special effects. Uh, total general illumination that seems to be coming first is when you have a whole lot of LEDs and you can use it for washing walls or such things. Uh, Thayer itself has some involvement. Uh, Charlie Sullivan, along with the graduate student Dan Harburg, are working to improve the efficiency of LED lighting uh, through developing new LED integrated circuit drivers. One of the big problems is the inductors, which they're working on to miniaturize and make higher efficiency. And we'll talk about efficiency a little later. Uh, Thayer has been replacing some fluorescents down by the machine shop with LEDs. And I invite you to go look at them uh, to see the difference and to explore by, by actual looking what the difference between LEDs and ordinary lights are. Why am I talking? This is not my research area. But, but one of the things I do as a member of the National Academy of Engineering is to monitor reports. Now, the National Academy is both a, an honorary place and also a place where the government asks us to write reports on status of various things. And we like to think our reports are the definitive reports without any bias. And so there was a committee involved in studying what's the future of solid state lighting. Once the report is written, it gets sent out to review just like a paper gets published. The only difference, well, yeah, the reviewers are secret as they are when you have papers published. And so it typically goes out to 15, 20 reviewers and they all send the reviewers back. And they need somebody in the academies who is willing to read the report and all the reviewers and decide if they agree with the reviewers or they think the report doesn't need to do what the reviewers said because the reviewers might have had their own bias. So I did that for this report. And it takes quite a bit of time, obviously, to read the report and 20 reviews and to figure out who's right and who isn't. So I figured as long as I had this knowledge, I would present it to you. Now, there's a caveat here because I'm not supposed to talk about the report until it's come out. 
Well, it hasn't come out yet because <laughs> Alex asked me to give this talk sooner than I had expected and the report's not out yet. So this is not a public disclosure. I'm letting you know that. This is not going on the web. I'm not actually giving any of the final results of the report anyway. Uh, so this talk is not the report. And if you want any absolutely accurate numbers, you'll have to wait till the report comes out. Uh, one other thing about involvement is you may be interested in LEDs, and there's a lot of things you can do with them yourself. You can make your own light sources if you want. And I found a very nice website that has a lot of information on how to make LED illuminating illuminations. So I've put that down here. So what is an LED? They're tiny light bulbs. I actually have one here, just a standard... Uh, 20 cent LED, which you can see, looks about like this. That one's red, but this is, this is what it looks like. It's a small piece of semiconductor about the size of a salt crystal, or larger in some cases, uh, embedded in plastic. And there'll be, I'll tell you why in a few minutes. So what we have is uh, that the light comes out in all directions from the LED. The difference between an LED and a laser is that the, the light from a laser is very pointed, as we know with our laser pointers. But the light comes out in all directions, and the lens will allow you to focus it back again, which is what this pointer is doing. It's giving you the image of the LED. There's an array of LEDs. You can sort of see the array pattern on that image. Um, so I'm going to talk about what this piece of semiconductor is. So it, it emits light not because it gets hot, which is a standard incandescent light, but by the fact that the electrons will fill up holes in the semiconductor diode. Uh, and again, you can see all these little diodes, little tiny uh, LEDs when you look at the new Christmas lights that have come out that a lot of people are getting. Now diodes most of the electrical engineers know, but other people may not. They're very thin layers of semiconductor material. Uh, on one side, they have material that is uh, filled with excess electrons called n-type, and on the other side of these layers, so it's shown vertically, but it's really a layer structure, and on this side, they have a, a less, whole, less electrons, and so it's called p-type, and what happens when you put a battery into a diode, just as the batteries in this LED are driving it, you're driving the electrons from the, this side to this side. And if you're an expert in semiconductor solid state physics, you'll understand that there's an energy diagram. So we have our electron side and we have our hole side. The electrons move over into the holes. And by energetics, which one can prove in a solid state physics class, the electrons have more energy than the holes. This is an energy diagram. And so when the electron sees a hole, that's a place that's missing the electron. The electron is going to fill up that hole. And the excess energy that it has, will, it'll put out in light. Now this same process is used for semiconductor lasers, for laser diodes. The difference is that this is called spontaneous emission. It happens by itself while lasers are stimulated emissions. So that if you like, the quantum mechanical process of emission is different, but it's the same recombination between electrons and holes. We say that. That really means an electron is filling up a hole. So the geometry, because it's not a laser, is that the, the recombination radiation, when that process takes place, it can go out in all directions. And this is supposed to show you the electrons in the holes and the radiation coming out in all directions. For some reason, it doesn't show, well, there's the radiation coming out the top. Um, the dimensions, as I said, are usually very small. It could be as small as a salt crystal. Now, if you're trying to get a lot of light, you need it bigger than that. But the point is that the, the actual radiating area is quite small. Uh, and we get spontaneous emission of the light from this recombination. It comes out in all directions. And the plan is to have LED lighting that will replace incandescence. And that's what we're talking about in this talk. Uh, now, the first thing to notice is the LEDs are not infinitely efficient. In fact, themselves, they have some problems with efficiency because the only light, here's your, 
Here's your active region. This is the, diff the P and N regions coming together here. And the light you want to look at out here, the light has to come out the top surface. And it can only come out the top surface through a certain cone of angles. In fact, this shows that if the angle gets too large, you get what's called total internal reflection, where the light reflects back into the sample rather than coming out. So the, the amount of light you get out is limited by the angle of this total internal reflection. Now, what makes it particularly difficult in LEDs, semiconductor LEDs, is that the angle is actually very small. So th those of you that talk about, that know about optics, know that there is such a thing as Snell's law, and the angle of the light coming out is proportional to the angle of the light coming in, sine of the angle, times the ratio of the refractive indices. And in this case, we're going from a large refractive index to a small refractive index. In fact, in a semiconductor, the refractive index is 3.5. It's very large. And in air, of course, it's 1. And by the time you put numbers in here, it turns out that angle is 18 degrees. So you're only getting out 18 degrees of the light that was emitted. All the rest of the light is lost. At least I don't have to worry about blinding you, which I would if it were a laser, right? Uh, all the rest of the light is lost. So the best you can have sort of in principle from a simple-minded device is 18%. Now, it's, you can increase it by encapsulating it with plastic. That's what I was mentioning, where the refractive index is not air anymore, but a higher refractive index. And that gives you an angle that is larger, 27 degrees. It's still pretty small. So there's a lot of work to try to up the efficiency by increasing uh, the amount of light that comes out. Now you can see that, that the light ref coming out in the downward direction, you could put a mirror under there or a reflective electrode, and you could double the efficiency. So instead of 27, we might expect 54%. That's not so bad. Um, there's also a phenomenon called photon recycling. If the light is, is totally internally reflected, it actually goes back in, and that light has a wavelength that will now create electron hole pairs. It was, it was create, the light came from combining electron hole pairs. Now the thing reverses, and the light can create electron hole pairs. Once you get a new electron hole pair, then that can also emit light. And so there's light coming from these secondary processes. So all I'm telling you is to actually calculate the efficiency of an LED is not easy. And I'm not going to try to do it from first principles here. I'm just telling you that the efficiency is going to be somewhere between 27% and maybe in principle 50, 60%. So the simplest LEDs that have been around were red. And they started with gallium arsenide is a substrate. Now, one of the things that I want to spend a little time, just so you feel knowledgeable about this, is that these are all made with materials that emit light. Silicon does not emit light, at least easily. It's not a very efficient light emitter. So if you look at the periodic table, I'll show it to you in a minute. Uh, it's a different part of the periodic table. But using uh, materials like gallium arsenide, you can create visible LEDs, in this case by adding uh, some phosphorus. The, the problem is that um, you have to have lattice match. The, as you grow the crystals, they have to all match up. Otherwise, you get a lot of strain. And oh, go away. Who did that? And uh, uh, so. But you can only grow binary materials. So you can grow gallium arsenide. You can grow it fairly big. Of course, silicon you can grow like this. Gallium arsenide you can now grow about like that. So you can grow a column of gallium arsenide. I had some. I could have brought it. That you can cut into layers of wafers. And you can use those wafers. Uh, so that's what it is. Gallium arsenide, a ternary grown on it. And the light then comes out. Uh, and the output will be what I call Gaussian-like. I actually have such an LED here. And the output comes out basically in all directions. So if we consider it a, an illuminator, uh, it's, you can see it. If 
I had a piece of white paper, you could see it better. We're getting some illumination, not very much. This actually happens to be a very powerful diode if I turn up its power. So you can watch. There's the, there's the most powerful. <laughs> yeah, OK. So you see, you can make pretty effective red light with this. The downside is you wouldn't want to look at it. It is really bright. And what that's telling you is it's coming from an incredibly small area. So if you want a lot of light, and if you could figure out how to do it efficiently, you could have all the light you could possibly want. And that's the advantage of LEDs. I'll turn it away from you so I don't blind you. All right, what's the matter? You don't like, you don't like me. All right. So a commercial LED is, I've basically told you these things. They, uh, they, they have these layers, the, the substrate and the active and passive layers, the active layers and the P and the N layers, and they, they're lying here across, across the lights coming out and, and being sent out. And that's what a typical LED looks like. And nowadays, you can get them in many colors. So I just got this off the web as a whole series of colors that are available. So you can sort of order the color you want. What you do notice, however, there's really no good green. There is an area right in here where there's no good LEDs. And that has an impact on the color that you're going to get when you uh, use LEDs. So what about illumination? I mentioned, you know, one of the questions with a new technology, and I should say that LEDs for illumination is a brand new technology. It's not like incandescence at all. Fluorescents were a brand new technology. They were introduced in the 30s. Now we're dealing with the first new, really revolutionary technology in illumination. And why now? The first LEDs did not have the colors that they do today. They were only the red. Uh, so in order to have white light, you need to have blue. And LEDs just didn't make blue for a very long time. Uh, gallium arsenide and some of the standard materials didn't make blue. And so you have to ask yourself, why did it take so long? And the answer is that we're going to use the material gallium nitride. And it turned out that it was very difficult to make a PN junction, which is what you need for a diode in gallium nitride. There's the periodic table. And I just wanted to show you, this is part of the periodic table. This is silicon and germanium and carbon. These are sort of the fundamental uh, of Silicon Valley. There's the silicon in the four column. Gallium arsenide is a three five. And all of our light emitting diodes, the best ones turned out to be three fives. And the farther down you go on the periodic table, the smaller the band gap. So you really want very light molecules that don't weigh much, so they have a big band gap. And so you'd love to have nitrogen. So gallium nitride is something they wanted from the very beginning. Uh, they had aluminum to replace the gallium, which tends to push into the red. And the red lasers have aluminum in them. Uh, and the phosphorus helps get you into the red. But to get into the blue, you need to go to nitrogen. And it took. A, actually an engineer in Nichia in Japan who worked nights without his company knowing it uh, was able to make it work. And uh, later on, he got all the patents and they wanted the patents, but they never paid a penny for him uh, for his research. And he actually won the patent suit and he's left Japan. He's now a professor at Stanford. He. Uh, <laughs> was not happy with the Japanese uh, industry when he left. Anyway, uh, so today, this is the material. And here are some of the other materials. And this is a whole range of colors. I showed you the graph that showed you the colors. So if you go on the web to find out any given color and you look carefully, they'll tell you exactly what the material is. And they're all in the three and the five columns. There was an early effort when they failed with gallium nice tried to make them out of two sixes. Zinc sulfide is a two six. But now that they've got these excellent devices, that basically has disappeared. 
So we now have visible emission. Uh, started out in the 70s, that's a sort of a repeat, but I wanted to remind us myself to tell you that the very first application for LEDs with calculators, if you've seen the original LED calculators, and then watches. And I used to have an LED watch, and I sure wish I'd kept it because it was great. Uh, it didn't show anything until you press the button. You press the button, it gives you the time. But you can't see it outside because the LEDs aren't bright enough. So it had a very limited life. As soon as they invented liquid crystal displays, the LED watches disappeared. But for a short time, the gallium arsenide phosphide uh, was in great demand, and it became very expensive. So it's always the supply of supply and demand. It was a gallium. Gallium is, is an off product of aluminum. And we were trying to do research on gallium arsenide lasers, and we couldn't buy gallium for a while because it was so expensive because they'd used up all the gallium. Nobody goes out and drills for gallium. They make aluminum, and alongside the aluminum, they get gallium for free. Uh, so we don't want too much to use too much gallium, or we may run out of. We won't run out of it because aluminum is a very common element. But we may not have the market. The market may be too great for the quantity, occasionally. And I just wanted to tell you that. So 1995 is when the Japanese developed uh, the, the gallium nitride. So how do we get white? I told you he made a blue laser LED. How do we get white? There are two basic methods. One is, as you know, if you combine red, blue, and green together, you can get a white. So we could make LEDs of these three colors and mix them together. Of course, you saw we don't have great green LEDs. And the, the other is to use a phosphor. So we can start with the blue, blue LED that puts out blue light and then use a material that is phosphorescent. In other words, when, you, when the blue light hits the phosphor, it emits other colors. And that can become white. And that's the most common method used today. And here's what the spectrum looks like. So if you've got a blue la it, it, it's not laser, sorry. I couldn't resist saying laser. It's a blue LED, a single color, because it's got a wide, it's a 50 nanometer wide, so it's not a laser. Uh, and then here's the phosphor spectrum. So if you combine these colors and this color, you get the white that the LEDs look like. Obviously, you can change the color by changing which phosphor you use. And different companies will have different phosphors that they want to use. We have an LED here, uh, three LEDs on a circuit board. In fact, Jeremy, I saw him. He's here. He's the one that used them for his 21 project. And they're extremely bright. And I thought I would show you uh, these. So. You can see, here's the white thing. You can see that I've got plenty of illumination here. So I'll turn that around. And I will now, uh-oh, I'm turning the wrong. Am I turning the right thing? Yeah, there. So you see that's really just amazingly bright. And the numbers tell us that we're getting out here when it's bright like that so that we can easily, easily read. We're, we're using five watts of, of energy to do that. So imagine what a five watt light bulb is to compare to here. You can see how much more light you have. Uh, and we no longer use the term watts uh, to describe lights. You all know what a 60 watt light bulb looks like, what a, a 30 watt look bulb looks like, but most of the, the light, most of the power in those kind of bulbs is wasted, the incandescence. And so we really want to use the visual spectrum, what it, the light we see. And so that's determined in terms of lumens. And so this particular light that you're seeing right now is putting out 390 lumens uh, at 5 watts or 78 lumens per watt. And I'll be talking about lumens per watt later, and then you can compare what a typical uh, energy for these light sources is. If you want to do the so-called RGB, that stands for red, green, and blue, you would have three different diodes, and you'd have them all in one package. 
And you, you could then tune each diode's color to get whatever color you liked. Of course, most of the people are light show people who like to, to vary them on and off, and you can get blinking colored lights uh, very easily now. So we've got the, we now understand the LED and how it needs to be encapsulated in plastic, and we've got this little device. How are we going to package it? So if you like what I'm showing you here, uh, these diodes are not fully packaged. They're merely the, um, the, the bare diode with its cap on, the, um, on some kind of a substrate, on some kind of a holder. Uh, but we need a package. So the individual devices have to be packaged, and you want to make sure that you've controlled them chemically. In other words, they don't degrade from water vapor. Uh, thermally, you don't want them to get too hot. And they are diodes, and if they get electrical signals in the wrong way, they may die, die on you. Uh, so they need all that protection to be uh, integrated into a final. Now, I learned all these new words, luminaire. Luminaire is the word that we normally call lamp. So if I put the light source in something, it's called a luminaire. Those are luminaires up there. Uh, so we, if we put the LEDs in there, we have to be careful about how we do it. That's what's called uh, uh, packaging. And we, we need to passivate it to protect it from degradation. And we also want to integrate a lens. I've talked about that. This happens to be one that I just picked up on the web. For $3, you can get a 3-watt output, 700 milliamps, or 180 lumens. Uh, so we agree that 180 lumens is, is sort of a 15-watt light bulb. So they're still a lot more expensive than ordinary lights, but they're cheap enough you can play with them if you want to. So the LED package has to remove heat. It has to protect against electrostatic discharge. And the various steps you have to go through pa with packaging are placing it in the chip carrier, attaching the lens, and the electrical and optical device testing. Now, it's that last thing that makes it particularly expensive, because it turns out that the colors are not reproducible, because the growth of the material is not very good. And so they have to test them all and put them in various bins. You know, here's a yellow-looking one, here's a blue-looking one, et cetera. So when you buy a dozen uh, LEDs from one company, you want to make sure that they're matched and came out of the same bin. That makes it very expensive because people have to enter the, the process. But a lot of this is the same sort of thing they would do for integrated circuits. So in principle, when the market is big as integrated circuit markets, this should all, the cost should all drop tremendously. Uh, and of course, if there's a phosphor coating, then it has to be added to the package as well. So just to show you an example of what a package looks like, and I won't go through the details, but here's a little lens on top. We've got the, the chip is this little square guy, and then it sits on a sub-mount, which is usually silicon, which is pretty highly conductive. It's more highly conductive than thermally than gallium arsenide. And we have a, a heat sink here because it is hot. It does get hot. Now we talk about how efficient it is. It's only seven watts. It's a lot more efficient than an incandescent, but heat, it doesn't like heat at all. If you have an incandescent light bulb, the hotter it is, the better. You like heat. But here we don't like heat, so we have to get rid of heat. Uh, and then there's a cathode lead in the outer package. Uh, so here uh, is sort of a quick comparison, 60,000 hours for LED versus up to 1,000 hours for incandescent. So if you look at one of the really big differences, they can run seven years without touching them, 24-7. But 1,000 hours is only a half a year if it's on full time. And one of the very first places where they began to use LEDs was traffic control lights, because those are on 24-7. And they didn't want to run around every half year and replace them. So now they don't have to replace them but once every seven years. So even though they're more expensive, that's all right. And of course, that's one of the arguments for having them in homes and, and in commercial establishments, because they will last a very long time, and the original price can, price can be amortized over a long time. 
Uh, the efficiencies can be high, typically today about 20%, while the incandescent is only 5%. So a good LED in a true bulb shape that you want to plug into your socket had better have louvers of some sort uh, to cool off its integrated circuits. But there's a lot of advantages for LEDs. We've already said they use a minimal power and therefore you save electrical power. You also avoid heating the room. Uh, and we talked about the long life. Uh, they're also useful for more than illumination. We've got our pretty Christmas tree lights out there. You can make them colored, white or colored, depending on what you do. And you can make new designs for lamps. Uh, and they can be battery operated and will last a very long time. Uh, and in terms of cost, it's worth noting that you can start with a four inch diameter. Actually, gallium nitride uh, devices are grown on sapphire. Sapphire is cheaper than, than buying real gallium nitride bulls, which are hard to make. Sapphire is easy to make. But there is a lattice mismatch of about 16%. And so there's a problem there. But if they can get the problem solved, just one wafer will give you 5,000 diodes. So like lasers, it becomes super cheap because you can take a wafer and divide it up into millions as integrated circuits have become cheap. We have the potential of having very cheap LEDs. Now, they do have drawbacks. And it's important to think about the drawbacks. The first is they don't run on 110. If you just took that and put it into the wall socket, you'd blow it out. Because a diode only runs at, at typically 3 to 5 volts. And so you need uh, some kind of a wall wart. This one here, I actually have a plugged in down here with a wall wart so that um, I have 5 volts coming out and can, can run it directly. Uh, this one, I used a power supply because my wall wart wouldn't take all the watts that this can put out. Uh, so you need to design power supplies. Um, and what you could do, of course, if you've already got a lamp, you could add to it a power supply in the cord and use it that way. But you can't just take a lamp and automatically put an LED in it and have it work. Now, one of the things they're planning to do is directly replace incandescent bulbs in luminaires in lamps to, that require electronics inside the bulb. Now, if you're one of the lighting specialists, you don't use the word bulb, you use the word lamp. So the word lamp to a lighting specialist is just the bulb. Uh, so uh, here are some lamps. And you see, again, the louvers in those lamps. Uh, another thing, you can't use the dimmers that we have developed. Uh, if you know about con um, CFLs, compact fluorescent lights, they don't work on incandescent dimmers. Well, the, these don't work on incandescent dimmers either. And so the dimmers have to be invented to work. And there's an interesting other thought about it. These LEDs don't die and go out in a flash like an incandescent light. Or even a fluorescent, when it's close to the end of its life, it sort of sputters and makes a horrible hum, and they get rid of it. These just go dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. So when is it time to change it? How little light can I read by? <laughs> you know, and, uh, so some people are suggesting that you might even have liability issues if you have LEDs in your yard and somebody trips because you're only running them at a quarter of what they originally were. Uh, you know, there might be a lawsuit there somewhere. So there are some interesting issues. When you change technologies abruptly from one to something with totally different characteristics, you really have to think about all these issues. And that's part of what the report that I was reading gets involved with. So we need integrated circuits in our LEDs. And I didn't talk to Charlie. And I'm embarrassed to do this, because Charlie's the world expert on this. Um, but this all, uh, I found something called O2 Micro, who claims they have the world's best integrated circuits. And they actually are integrating it with a Philips bulb. And in this one, I believe, looking at it, that the integrated circuit is put right up here, because that's actually the coolest place in the bulb. But I'm not positive about that. Uh, in any way, uh, they've developed a dimmer, uh, which actually it's an integrated circuit that works by, as you turn the light on and off, 
it will first go to low and then to medium and then to high, a little bit like the old-fashioned three-way uh, lamps that, that used to have three power settings in incandescence. This would do the same sort of thing. And it's certainly a possible way to go. Uh, it's worth pointing out that there are this 150 million incandescent dimmers, and we're talking about coming up with something that hopefully we could, don't have to replace the dimmers, uh, but maybe we do. And it also turns out that with those dimmers, uh, you run into various problems, such as they flick, flicker and they are very poor when you get near the off condition. Talk to Charlie if you want more about that. Um, I like all the pictures on the web of things going on in Europe. There doesn't seem to be any Americans really into the design. Uh, but well, how can you design a, a luminaire using the properties of LEDs? And I think this is a particularly nice one. They've actually got different color LEDs in various rings to give you a nice pattern of light. Uh, it won some kind of an award in Europe. Uh, they also have nice lights that can, basically they look like replacements for ordinary bulbs, but they can be very interesting. I thought I'd try to make a catalog of all the various bulbs, sorry, lamps, and discovered that it was impossible. I found one site that had 86 different types. Now those are just types. Each one of those types you could get from, you know, one LED to dozens of LEDs. So. I, there's no doubt that the number of LED lamps and luminaires available is uncountable because it's cheap. If you've got an LED for $3 and you can put it in a lamp like this and sell it for $100, look at all the money you've made. Now what's going to happen, of course, is very soon the market is going to uh, even out and a lot of those companies are going to die and a few companies are going to go on and do very well. Um, and then I've mentioned some non-illumination applications. I mentioned the traffic lights. Uh, visible LEDs give you a lot of possibilities. We know about flashlights. We're holding one right now. Uh, and again, the, the half-life, this says 11 years. Depends on if you're an optimist or not. Uh, and so there's also ways that you can do digital displays. So what does the future have in sight? Uh, right now, the manufacturing yield is very low. If you think about a 50% yield, you're making these vast quantities of LEDs and half of them you throw away. That's not very good. Uh, but if everything is done the way the Department of Energy wants it to be done, they're going to have yields of greater than 95%. Uh, and obviously, that's going to lower the cost and improve the quality. And what is really the, the limiting effect is the control and uniformity of the epitaxial growth, which has a big impact on the whole thing. And these improvements, if they do that all the way back at the very beginning of the material, will exercise what they call a lever effect on the cumulative yield. So uh, you won't have to, to keep testing these things as you go along. And so it'll have a final device cost and the selling cost uh, we'll go down through improved binning yield, and I've described binning to you what binning is. So what are the technology advances that are needed? This is the sort of thing the report was looking into. Uh, there is a phenomenon called droop at particularly high powers in LEDs, and it used to be thought this was a limiting process. They seem to have gotten rid of a lot of it, but at the highest power levels and at the uh, when you don't have high efficiency, you can have the light output no longer linear with the light, with the, with the current. So you're losing efficiency at high powers. Uh, I mentioned cooling. Uh, more needs to be done on that. Now that we know what we've got in the way of, of light sources, we, we want to figure out what's the best way to make a, quote, luminaire. I mean, by the way, it is getting hot. Uh, you can see that you can see light through it. If this were just a light piece of plastic, it would diffuse it more and not blind you. So you'd like to find a way to get the light to give you the pattern you want without losing a lot of light. At the same time, you can see that the edges of this light are, are quite sharp. 
There's no light over here coming from these. They're, they're quite focused in the forward direction. So if you had them up, up high pointing down, they tend to point down in a nice area. They're perfect if you've got a desk sitting there and you have the light like that. But if you drop something on the floor and it rolls out of the light, uh, you better hope there's another light nearby. So they are very different in many ways from what we're used to. Um, so materials improvements, uh, drive electronics uh, has been mentioned several times, and I'm glad that Charlie's going to solve that problem for us. Uh, we also it would like, be nice to have larger diodes, brighter diodes, and again, this reproducible color tone. So materials growth, I mentioned what's important here is defects. I mentioned there's a 16% lattice mismatch. And so that leads to defects, and that leads to an increased electrical resistance that we have to decrease. We also need to start with good starting materials, uh, and all of that will lead ultimately to lower cost. So here are some predictions on what they expect. So starting in, in 2010, if you assume that, that this was for every dollar that your cost was, by 2012, it should be 60 cents. By 2015, it should be 30 cents, and by 2020, it should be 10 cents. Now, I haven't checked to see if, in fact, LEDs are half the price or 60% the price they were two years ago. It would be interesting to see if that curve is being followed. Um, so what I've said is that, that solid-state lighting is a new technology that involved from a few key inventions uh, involving light-emitting diodes back in the 60s. More recently, it was spurred on by the fundamental breakthrough in the 90s, i.e. the gallium nitride. Uh, so it's not a refinement of an incumbent technology, but it's a brand new, and it's involved in parallel with incandescent and fluorescent lamps. So we really need to compare them with the other technologies that exist. So here we have our incandescent, we have a fluorescent. This is a compact fluorescent. And we have these LEDs. Now you understand this funny shape, by the way, right? These yellow guys are the phosphors that are causing the, it to be white from the blue LEDs, which are underneath them. And here are the louvers keeping it cool. Uh, so you understand all that now. Here's the original little diodes. So in order to compare these, as I mentioned earlier, we need to look at lumens. Uh, lumens is the luminous flux weighted by the wavelength sensitivity of the visual system. We don't want to use watts because watts is just the amount of electricity used, and we don't want to necessarily just getting a low electricity may mean a low light. You don't want that. Uh, so lumen lumens is what we want. It describes the rate at which a lamp emits visible light. I told you what a luminaire was. There's my picture of a luminaire. Uh, and I'm also mentioned halogens because I had to look up what they were. I didn't know. They're incandescents that have added a tungsten filament and iodine as a vapor, and that allows a high temperature operation and a higher brightness, and they move to the white in the spectrum. Uh, but they're still incandescents and therefore fundamentally not very uh, efficient. Here is the wavelength sensitivity of the visual system. This is 480 nanometers here, and this is 630 nanometers. So the peak of our visual system is in the green. That's the chlorophyll color. That's why leaves are green and look so pretty to us. Uh, and this is luminous flux as the light coming out in all directions. So I'm getting to the term efficacy, which is an important one if you really want to look at what's going on. Efficacy is a measure of the efficiency with which a lamp or a luminaire converts electricity to useful light. So specifically, it's the ratio of the luminous flux to the total electrical power consumed. So it's lumens per watt. And to see a comparison, a typical 60-watt light bulb of an incandescent sort has an efficacy of 14 lumens per watt. Uh, a total, that means it's putting out a total of, if you had that much power, I don't know what I mean by that. Forget that. If you had a good light source that converted all the electricity into visible light with good color rendering by the units and the way they're defined, your efficacy would be 408 lumens per watt. That's the best you really could get. If you had a light source that exactly, whoops, 
<laughs> that exactly match that spectrum, you would have a, a, a and 100% conversion efficiency, you would end up with that many lumens. High quality LEDs right now are between 60 and 188 lumens per watt. And the one that I have here, as I said, was 78. So it lies certainly in the range of light sources today. These are, by the way, three-year-old LEDs, so they're already out of date. One last thing we need to look at is chromaticity. That's the color I've already mentioned several times that LEDs differ in color. And uh, it's the color of light perceived by people. That's called chromaticity. Uh, and we should know that the human visual system does not process light on a wavelength by wavelength basic basis. Instead, the brain receives signals from only three input channels. Uh, the eyes, are, that's the, eye, the different cone photopigments in the eye. So there's different ways you can have a spectral SPD, spectral density, uh, that can produce the identical chromaticity. But chromaticity varies with the manufacturing process, and we're very sensitive to nuances in color. So this is where, again, we have to do a post-manufacturing selection, and that makes them expensive. So there are no real good standardizations of color. So when you buy an LED, if you just buy it off the web, you don't know if that white is going to be a white that you like or not. Uh, here's an example, an interesting example, where they sort of did this theoretically. They said, here's the visual sensitivity. Here are four different kinds of light sources, all that would look the same color to you as a person. Uh, this is the incandescent, and you see most of the energy is way out here where you can't see it. This is in the infrared, the red and infrared. So incandescents look reddish yellow, and that's those. You could do the RGB, mixing the blue, uh, the red, and the green, and put those together, and, and it would look white. Uh, we've talked about this one looking white. Or you could have a laser exactly at the center of your color, and I guess they claim it would look white. I don't know. I'm, those lasers don't exist, so I don't know if it would or not. Um, so what I wanted to do, I'm, I don't know if you can read this or not, but I think it's an important slide. Uh, the question is, does the light source need a ballast? In other words, do we need to do something to that light source to hook it up to 110 AC that we have in, in the world? And obviously, with an incandescence, we don't have to. With an incandescent, you just use whatever electricity God gave you, or in this case, man gave you, women gave you. Uh, halogens are also incandescent, so they don't have ballasts. When you start getting into fluorescent tubes uh, and high-intensity discharges, which I'm not talking about, and then the white light LEDs, you have to have some electronics that is going to be able to to tailor the electricity to be what you not need to run that light source. And you see these numbers go from 65% to 95% and various numbers like that. So the 95% are saying that if you have the right design for your electronics, you should be able to hit, have only about a 5% loss in changing the uh, grid, what comes off the grid, to the light source. On the other hand, if you're not careful, you can have 45 to 50 uh, percent type losses here. And so it needs to be properly designed. Then once you've done that, you have the efficacy of the lamp itself. Remember, the lamp is the light bulb. So the LEDs can put out 60 to 188 lumens per watt. An incandescent puts 4 to uh, 18 lumens per watt. So you see the tremendous advantage of factor of 10 over the LED has over the incandescent. If you look at a fluorescent tube, it's actually not quite as impressive. Unless if a lousy LED is going to be comparable to a fluorescent tube. So it's no better than a fluorescent tube unless you get one of these really high quality LEDs, in which case you gain quite a bit. Uh, Compact fluorescents, by the way, are not as impressive as ordinary fluorescent tubes. That's worth knowing. Um, and now we then have to put it in a luminaire. We put it in some kind of a light source, and I mean a lamp, a, a, a shade. Put a shade on your lamp. And you see that those luminaires can be 90% efficient. LEDs, they claim they can be 95% efficient, down to only 40% efficient. 
So if you put all this together, you end up with numbers that give you the overall efficacy of an a incandescent going from 2 to 16 and LEDs going a factor of 10 larger than that. So you can see definitely that there's reasons why we want to do LEDs for um, lighting. This is another graph that sort of says the same thing. Here are the various light sources, and these lines have two points. They have a low efficiency and a high efficiency. So depending on the, the quality of what you're working on, uh, you could be down here with a very low efficiency fluorescent or a high efficiency fluorescent. And again, incandescents are not even worth talking about. LEDs go from here up to about 45% efficiency. The, there is a target that DOE has to reach 50% in the next, I think, five years. I've forgotten the time frame. Uh, but that's also a nice curve that shows you sort of a comparison. So the lighting consumption we have today. So the question is, if we do all this, how much do we save the world? And so I put together a bunch of numbers. And I came up with, and these are numbers that DOE gives as well as the report and various other places. Uh, lighting uses 17% of the US electricity. And US electricity uses 14% of the total energy usage in the US. Now, the total energy usage is given in terms of quads. And I don't know what a quad is, but our entire energy usage in the United States is 99 quads. Well, that's nice. It's almost 100. Uh, so you, in fact, for electricity, they talk about terawatt hours. So if you look on the web, you can find out that 300 terawatt hours is approximately one quad. So that's the conversion. And when I did the conversion, I've converted the terawatt hours, which is listed in the report, to quads, and then to the percentage of, of the lighting so residential uses 25% of the lighting, electrical lighting. Commercial uses 50% of the electrical lighting. And industrial, not very much. Uh, they're very good about fluorescence, so they're quite efficient. And for outdoor lighting, which would be the street lights, et cetera, they're using almost as much as we use. In terms of the percentage of total electrical use, uh, the residential is about 4%. Uh, the highest is commercial, which is 8%. Um, and then if you look at the, the total usage of electricity, as I said, was 17%. And then if you look at the percentage of the total 99 quads, just take everybody and change it by a factor of 10 uh, from here to here, and you get um, the percentage of the total amount of energy usage in the United States. Now, I want to show you that because this is a very small number at least it like, seems like a small number. It's less than 1%. So if we could improve the efficiency of lighting for our homes by 50%, that's only going to change this number by 50%. So we're only going to change it by 0.3% of the energy usage in the, in the United States. So looked at on this global scale, it's not terribly impressive. But if you count the number of power plants that we have, which is in the hundreds, we can certainly reduce the number of power plants we need. Uh, and it's certainly worth doing. Every little bit that we can save is worth doing. Uh, in addition to the green part, it's really the many, many uh, years they work without changing them. And uh, other reasons besides the green part that makes them really worth doing. So whether, this, whether these products are called solid state, solid state lighting, uh, whether they'll be able to achieve widespread deployment will depend on cost and consumer acceptance. Uh, the cost depends on the things we've talked about, um, the ease of manufacturing, et cetera. And, but I want to remind you, with all fundamentally new technologies, there are kinks that have to be worked out before the market grows. And you can pick any technology you want. I remember when I graduated from college, this will tell you how old I am, uh, we bought the world's best mono, I can't even say mono stereo. It was a, a mono sound system. And we had tape deck for all of our hi-fi music. 
and bought a whole bunch of tapes. Well, that was one year before they invented stereo. And you can have the world's greatest stereo system, and now there's surround sound. So what that's telling us is that we're going to continue to see changes in LEDs. And I, I have my own personal belief, which is someday we're going to have the laser as the, the causing the, the phosphorescence, because it can be as close to 100% as anything. Um, but that's, nobody's talking about that. And I know I'm getting short on time, but I did want to talk, if you, if you will give me two minutes, three minutes, uh, a little bit about the federal government, because the federal government has a big impact on this. I could give an hour's talk on the impact of the government, particularly Department of Energy. I'm not going to do that, but I'm merely going to point out to you that there's a lot of federal energy statutes. In other words, Congress has gotten involved, and Congress says, thou shalt, thou shalt do this. Uh, and then that's what's helping the energy efficiency. If we didn't have this, people would probably stay with their, their old technologies. And so DOE has developed a uh, R&D program, which again, I won't go through with because uh, there's not time, uh, but these are all on DOE's website, and if anybody really wants this information, I can give you the, the, send you the slides. Uh, and they've listed the things I've been talking about as core focus, technology focus, uh, things basically what they're going to fund, uh, and product development focus areas, and then manufacturing focus areas. Uh, and that was added later when they began to realize that manufacturing was limiting how well we could do. And there's still a question, are we going to be able to succeed better than China and some of the other countries that are really quite advanced. Philips, which is in um, Eindhoven, or maybe even Germany, is way ahead of us. Uh, so the prediction there, I just discovered looking on the web that there's a report that literally came out today. No, I think it was a year ago. I'm sorry. It was, it was January, but it was January 2012, so it was a year ago. Uh, that gives you a lot of uh, predictions for the future um, and predicting that we're going to save nine quads of energy. But if you look at the fine print, that's over 20 years. So per year, it's not that many quads compared to the 99 quads we're spending per year. Uh, nonetheless, this is a coming technology. They also predict that the first places they're going to use it as commercial and outdoors, and it's only later that, that residential and industrial is really going to make a big difference. So you don't necessarily have to run right out and buy uh, LED lamps. Uh, there was a thought that they were going to phase out incandescence literally this year, and there was enough pushback by a lot of people that they've changed that. There was a lot of uh, experience with compact fluorescence that when they first came out, they didn't work very well at all. And a lot of people got very unhappy and then didn't want them because they had all these characteristics they didn't like. And the compact fluorescents are much better now than they were, but a lot of people are just turned off by them because they, they weren't happy with them the first few days or the first few years. So LEDs may run into that same pattern, or maybe we'll get them all going to the point where they're wonderful, and then uh, people will really switch. Now, one thing I didn't talk about because I knew my talk was going to be too long is organic LEDs. Uh, this is another way of the future. They are farther off of uh, another probably five years before they're coming. They have a couple of major problems. Uh, mainly, they don't live very long, <laughs> long enough. They're, they're right now, they last about like incandescence, and they really have to solve that problem, and they're not sure how. So there's a lot of research that goes on behind this. The way they work is basically the same way. You have electrons and holes that recombine and give light, but in organics, the electrons and holes are in organic molecules, and they have to sort of work their way through the molecules to find each other. And, uh, there's a lot of information about those as well on the web. And this report that, that if you want uh, to know when the report comes out, if you send me an email, I can always let you know when the report comes out. Uh, so 
if we're thinking about bright ideas for the future, uh, we're no longer going to be able to draw incandescent bulbs. In fact, if any of you become professors, your students won't even know what an incandescent light is. Uh, we're going to have to talk about the LED light bulbs. Or if you're an engineer, you may want to do it that way. <laughs> for those who are not electrical engineers, that's the symbol of a diode. <laughs> Okay. And if anybody knows of specific LED projects going on that they want to talk about, please do, yes? Elsa, do you know where the uh, efficiency, the uh, yield uh, numbers come from? At which stage in uh, production of those devices? Because that's pretty loud. The 50% yield that you mentioned. I mean, semiconductors are far more complicated than that. Yield no, the, 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 yeah, but you're talking about silicon. <laughs> no, the problem is there's a 16% lattice match, mismatch. And there's, so there's, there's threading dislocations like MAD, and they have to find ways. So they have strain-relieving layers, and they're just not very uniform. And so they haven't solved that problem. There's, there is a project to, do, to, be, to be able to grow wafers of gallium nitride directly in which case they wouldn't have this problem. Yeah? Yeah, it's worth mentioning that it's disconcerting to me when a bunch of other things all go absolutely clear and transparent and they're different colors. You don't know what color they are until you power it. Yeah, because the, the, the one I have here... Yeah, I don't know what the color is. They, well, that's a good point. The, you get color out of white light, uh, out of incandescence, by putting filters in front. So if you ever worked in uh, the theater, you know that theater lighting changes by putting uh, filters in and out. And they're basically wasting all the rest of the light. So a typical theater lighting might be a kilowatt, but they're not using nearly that to get red. They're just filtering out what they don't want. LEDs put out 100% of what you're asking for in principle. And so they have this possibility of, in principle, 95% efficiency. You know, and they are, that is really revolutionary. There's no doubt about it. And that's why it would be very nice if I could show, show you the, the, the lighting on the um, uh, Empire State Building, because that's why they did that. They're saving vast amounts of money. Oh, I forgot that one. <laughs> Sorry, I left on a high note rather than this one. <laughs> but uh, that was to show you that there's various kinds of, of illumination techniques, and yet you can use LEDs for other things as well as illumination. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to look at the end, I'm going to look for that video to show, but there's questions. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. The, the uh, Chinese have been using them tremendously for the, the Olympics in many of those um, uh, Olympic show that they had at the beginning of the Olympics. It was an amazing number of LEDs that they were using. And all of the big displays now in the um, uh, stadiums, the baseball, football stadiums, those are all LEDs. In fact, you can recognize, well, we live in a small town, so we don't have big billboards. But if you drive down, I certainly know Los Angeles has great big billboards uh, made with LEDs. In fact, I think they're distracting to drivers because they're so bright. Uh, I'm not sure they're safe, but that's another question. Yes, displays are definitely here. Other questions? <laughs> <laughs>